right, so I guess we'll get started here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the Trust Scholarly Network's lecture series, Democracy at a Critical Crossroads in an Era of Disinformation. My name is Ashley Mellenbacher, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Waterloo and a Canada Research Chair, and also the co-director of the Trust Network, the Trust in Research Undertaken in Science and Technology, or Trust Network, uh, with co-director Donna Strickland. Uh, the University and the Basili School of International Affair Affairs acknowledges much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus and the CG campus are situated on the Haldeman Track, land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is coordinated with the Office of Indigenous Relations at the University of Waterloo. Thank you to all of you joining us tonight in person and online. Uh, I'd also like to thank the City of Waterloo Mayor Dorothy McCabe for joining us tonight. The Trust Scholarly Network is a University of Waterloo initiative that intersects faculties and disciplines through important research on our societal futures. Through its scholarly network, Trust works to address complex questions around science, technology, including those social and ethical dimensions of discovery in these fields, and public dissemination of knowledge in science and technology, and the very <coughs> real limits of our understanding. Tonight, we're partnering with the Basili School of International Affairs to explore these questions of knowledge, both in its disseminations, its limits, and conversations about democracy and disinformation. We're happy to have you join us for what's uh, certainly to be a rich and important conversation about cultural shifts leading to the, the mass spread of misinformation and disinformation and how it's affecting our democracies globally, particularly here in North America. We are excited to hear from our panelists who are leading experts on false how false information, whether intentional or not, uh, is affecting the global population and political views. Uh, we'll get things started soon, but just a couple of housekeeping notes first. There'll be a Q&A as part of the panel uh, discussion, so if you have questions, please make your way to the microphones located on the landings on the left side of the theater, uh, and there'll be more instructions. So we can do that kind of once we get started. The moderator will let you know. Following the formal program, there will be a sort, short reception outside of the theater where you can continue the conversation um, and enjoy some light refreshments. So I'd now like to introduce you to the University of Waterloo's President and Vice Chancellor, Vivek Goel, for some brief remarks. Welcome, Vivek. Thank you, Ashley. It's a great honor to join everyone here for this installment of the Conversations on Trust in Science and Technology Lecture Series. I'd also like to thank the Balsili School of International Affairs for partnering with the university to present this event. This lecture comes at an extraordinary time when society is struggling to address increasing polarization due to myriad factors such as global conflicts and geopolitical tensions or the climate crisis. The spread of misinformation along with the astonishing speed of technological advancements are changing the way we interact and learn about the world around us. When I trained as a public health physician almost 35 years ago, in a five-year training program for public health medicine, we had a three-hour workshop on communications and media relations. <laughs> and the message was very simple. Put on a white coat, hold a press conference at 3 p.m., and you're gonna command the six o'clock news and the next day's paper very quaint to think about that's I can assure you in, in today's training for public health physicians there's much more attention to communications but as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic the approach to holding press conferences to disseminating information continues as the primary mode for our public health leaders and it's simply not the way we can get the messages across to the public today what we took for granted that there would be confidence in our institutions and our leaders 
has been completely eroded. Today, our panelists will discuss how we can make informed decisions or respond to global challenges in this new normal where facts are increasingly contested. Disinformation and misinformation are leading to polarization, voter apathy, and a lack of trust in science and public institutions. It's leading to a lack of trust in each other. It is encouraging to see the work being done by my Waterloo colleagues from across disciplines as they seek to defend this concept of trust and truth. The Trust Scholarly Network is intended to start important conversations like the ones we'll hear today and improve communication with the public to once again build trust in research, science, and technology. We're fortunate to live and work in a region with a high concentration of academic institutions and think tanks like CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, and the Balsillie School of International Affairs. These institutions are playing an important role both independently and together to build evidence-based contributions to inform public discourse and opinion and further the knowledge society. And we're very grateful to the support of Jim Belsilli, who's here with us tonight, not only financial, but intellectual leadership that has made these such successful institutions. I'd also like to thank our panelists for joining us this evening to share their expertise and insights, and thank you all for participating today and showing your interest in the future. We all play a role in building trust in society. Now, it's my privilege to introduce Besma Mamani, who's a professor of political science and assistant vice president international at the University of Waterloo. She's also a senior fellow fellow at the Balsili School of International Affairs and a non-resident fellow of the Arab Gulf States Institute. Professor Mamani will moderate today's panel. Please welcome Professor Mamani. Thank you, Vivek, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is a really great uh, uh, chance for us to hear from some world-renowned experts uh, on a very heavy topic. Uh, I know it weighs on all of us. Uh, democracy today, it seems like it's not just at a critical crossroad, but almost in a constant battle. And uh, what we're going to hear today, I think, is going to be on one hand quite frightening, but hopefully uh, leave us all feeling more empowered and more knowledgeable about the things that we can do. So it brings me great pleasure to welcome our panel members to the stage. We have Dr. Joan Donovan. She's an award-winning sociologist, assistant professor of journalism and emerging media studies at Boston University and founder of the Critical Internet Studies Institute. She is co-author of Meme Wars, The Untold Story of the Online Battles Upending Democracy in America. And Dr. Donovan's research focuses on media manipulation and democracy. Her work has been showcased in various outlets such as NPR, New York Times, MIT Technology Review, and more. She is the former research director of Harvard University Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy. Thank you, Joan, and welcome. Dr. Ann Fitzgerald is the director of the Balsa School of International Affairs and a professor in Wilfrid Laurier University's Political Science Department. She has degrees in both commerce and political science from Queen's University and was the first civilian female to graduate from the Royal Military College of Canada. Before completing a PhD in the UK, she worked at the Pearson Peacekeeping Center, NATO headquarters, and the North Atlantic Assembly, and is widely published on issues concerning the governance of national security and has helped facilitate national security policies and strategies in a number of conflict-affected countries, and has also supported internationally sponsored peace talks. And last but not least, John Polis is the founding president and CEO of Dominion Voting System. As CEO of Dominion, uh, John leads the company's business and operational strategy with the mission of providing technology and services that make elections more secure, accessible, and efficient, and is grounded in a culture of transparency and accountability from the foundation of Dominion's success. 
A native of Toronto, John has been recognized for his many accomplishments, including being selected as one of Canada's top 40 under 40 business leaders in 2010 and receiving the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award in 2013 for philanthropic work. Tonight, I'm um, very happy to welcome and please. <laughs> so um, I think we're all um, facing a lot of challenges in, in hearing about um, the state of democracy today. It, it's not a, we're not in a happy place, uh, let's just say. Um, and I know that many of us, uh, the very um, thought of uh, a very tough election cycle coming, uh, I that I mean the, the United States, but I think we can also say here in Canada, perhaps next year, means that we're going to see a torrent of a lot of disinformation, a lot of doubt. Uh, this is going to be one of the most important elections where we now have the advent of not just chat GPT, but generative AI making any video that you can imagine in your mind possible. Um, and it can be the faces and sounds and very much the likeness of our world leaders um, today. So this is a very difficult year. 2024 is one of the most consequential election years ever. Um, in fact, the majority of the world is, is out there to vote, um, thanks to India, which we're just seeing right now. So it's um, a tough time. And I'm really happy to have um, these three great um, scholars and practitioners to talk about this. So I'd love to start with you, Joan. Give us your thoughts as you hear the word disinformation, democracy at a crossroads. What comes to mind to you? Well, thank you so much. And it's really great to be here. Um, I, not, I don't think this was in my bio, but uh, I did live in Montreal uh, for quite some time. And I remember why I left the United States, partly because I needed to get a decent education at a good price. <laughs> so <laughs> Canada's the way to go. Uh, but also, as a, as a gay woman, uh, I was facing, you know, four more years of George Bush. And I thought to myself, America, you're freer than you feel. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can uh, do things, but they're gonna be hard and they're gonna be challenging and you have to fight for your people. Um, and so what I really wanted to do was get an education first before I, I kind of put the boxing gloves on. Um, and so when I think about uh, my career and where I am as a researcher that studies media manipulation and disinformation, first and foremost, I'm a sociologist of knowledge. I care about how we make facts. I care about how we trust institutions. I care about the things that erode our ideas of what counts as truth. Um, but uh, right now, it's, it seems like there's no better business to be in than telling lies at scale. And in the US, the tech lobby has become the biggest lobby on Capitol Hill, which means tech runs uh, quite a bit of government thinking about regulating tech. This is very similar to the playbooks of tobacco and oil where they were producing their own research about their products mm -hmm. and they were saying everything's good you know look away that lung cancer can't be caused by these cigarettes mm -hmm. it's probably the carpets or you know other chemicals a as a matter of fact the tobacco companies wanted to in their research wanted to define everyone as active or passive smokers so you know the idea that other researchers were saying was that well, secondhand smoke has an effect. And the tobacco companies would just say, yeah, but that's just passive smoking. Everybody smokes. And if you see the world as being your potential customer, you don't think about the harms that your products cause to uh, individuals and in the case of where at least social media over the last decade has arrived, the point they've arrived to, arrived to is they're very anti-democratic. They're very anti uh, anything that is going to upset the balance for which you spend most of your time on these platforms. But I think there was no uh, uh, clearer example of this when Meta shut off the news in Canada. I've been really you know, ringing that bell in the US because you need information, really good information to make high quality choices, right? And the less 
uh, or the more I should say your information is not just impoverished, but is then also doubly polluted by disinformers and media manipulators, the less likely we are going to have an informed and in, in a healthy society. And so when I'm thinking about disinformation as a research area, I'm thinking about what are the costs to the public for having lies be told at scale? What is the cost to individuals? And I guess what I would say on the horizon of all of this when it comes to democracy is that we've always had information inequalities drive our political process, especially little things like who gets to know where they're gonna put the power plant and who gets to know where they're gonna run you know, uh, gas lines or water lines in certain cities. These are people usually that are plugged in, but also are of a certain status. And so the news and, and media, <coughs> local media, is crucial for the everyday practice of democracy, not just the big moments of elections. Uh, and so that's what I've been thinking about. Thank you. And big question, you hear the word democracy, disinformation, all that's happening today, what comes to mind? As a professor of national security, Vesna, I think what comes to mind is the greater question of the impact on democracy, but also how do we interpret this through an international security framework? So I think the impact on democracy comes at three different levels. There's the impact on the individuals themselves, um, this, this uh, projection vis-a-vis -vis technology in an ungoverned space, which is effectively what is happening is breaking down relationships all over society. Um, it's having an impact on institutions. The amplification of echo chambers is swamping our institutions to the point where they cannot respond to the, the people's needs, the everyday demands of the people. Um, and if you have an institutional deficit, you want leadership to navigate through these difficult times. And we're finding that leaders don't want to lead anymore because it comes at such a high personal cost of doing so because of the reputational issues, the smear campaigns, uh, everything that seems to be propelled in this ungoverned space. I, I suppose through an international security framework, uh, I think about warfare. And there are five domains now when we look at warfare. There's not just the land, sea, and air. There's the space and the cyber. And the regulatory frameworks are lagging uh, far behind. But even on land and sea and air, our regulatory frameworks are really unable to cope with the, the, the sweep up. We've always seen a sweep up of technology advancements. And then government catches up. There's a rebalancing between freedoms and responsibilities. I think now we're looking at this. And mm. we're all trying to race to to climb up and, 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 and regulate in some way. So um, yeah, psychological warfare, informational warfare, uh, it's, it's, um, it's cyber operations, and uh, foreign interference is driven by this as well. So I think in response, if uh, as a director of a school of public policy studies, I think of three different areas. First all, of all, technology and uh, uh, different technology means to help us navigate through this. But of course, technology is dual use. So with every development, um, that can be used two ways, in two ways, for, for, the, for the good or for the bad, or illicitly or illicitly. Um, I think about regulatory frameworks as well. And if you, if you sit back and look at the news, it seems like there's a lot going on in this area. But in real terms, it's sluggish. I think a lot of people are sitting back waiting for the United States and the European Union to lead. And it's essential that as national governments, we cluster up with like-minded partners and look for good practice to try to drive policy forward. And then lastly, and I think the, the, the most important area, and I probably would say this as an educator, is education and engaging with society at all levels, uh, graduate studies, undergraduate studies, high school, um, really, really socializing this as an issue 
um, even showing people how disinformation is created because the difference between disinformation a long time ago and disinformation today is that people have access to it very easily and it's cheap and um, people can create deep fakes, et cetera, very easily. So I think engaging with society at every level and bringing those groups together to generate citizen action and collective action towards the solution uh, is, is fundamental. It develops uh, critical thinking resilience, which I think is important for mm -hmm. a country like ours, very diverse, um, welcomes many different people from around the world, and that's uh, very important to Canada, but we need to protect our national interests and core values against these attacks. Mm, thank you. John, y you're uh, the CEO of a company that uh, would benefit from seeing everybody democratized, so how wonderful would it be? Um, but you're also, as a company, been the subject of a lot of disinformation. So as you see this, I mean, these two things have, have come together, and, and it really is a character of our time in many ways. What are your thoughts on democracy and disinformation? Uh, well, just listening um, to what Ann and <coughs> Joan was saying, um, we have seen dif disinformation for many years percolate in weird corners of the Internet, and quite honestly, 2015 or so, 16, we never really thought much of it, just thought it was just crazy internet noise. Um, and one thing that resonates uh, when I hear Joan talk about how it's big business, one thing that I never would have imagined was trusted news sources uh, purposefully lying to their audience uh, for uh, monetary gain. Um, and when it happened to us, we were just so ill-prepared for it. Mm -hmm. um, and we just kept naively thinking that we, um, we, we were first accused of stealing the election, and all we really do is help blind people vote and help election administrators count paper ballots that are audited by hand anyway. And um, so it's the easiest thing in the world to check. All you have to do is hand count the paper ballots, which of course our customers do. So uh, in the days after 2020, uh, when we started seeing some of this usual disinformation coming from the internet. It was a couple days later, then all of a sudden, some very powerful um, trusted news sources. And a lot of my friends scoff at the label of trusted news, and um, you really can't put your own value judgment on it, and um, you just have to understand that a lot of people, if, if somebody views something as a trusted news source, uh, what they say is the truth. Um, and I, I listen to the cr critical uh, thinking resilience. I, I think that gets tends to erode when it's an emotional issue, mm -hmm. something as emotional as uh, my political candidate lost, um, my society is being stolen from me, um, and you know lots of other analogies of that. So I think that that's the the first thing that goes out the window. Um, and for us, it was just so incredibly false, that we just knew that they knew that they were lying. Like, I, it's not that hard to figure out I'm not from Venezuela. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, and I'm not at the same time from Cuba, um, and, nor China. And, you know, they were saying all of those things pretty much the same time, uh, along with a whole host of other things that were not just, uh, it, it, they just knew, we, we just knew that they knew. Um, and unfortunately, we tried every single avenue of setting the record straight, and uh, the only one that uh, w we had to rely on the very last um, option for us, which is uh, seek litigation and go through a discovery process. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, if people are Googling what's happening right now, you, you, you were very much in the news for, for many, many years um, uh, because of what you had to endure with your company. Um, and Joan, I'm going to turn to you because uh, you've also been recently in the news. <laughs> and uh, we've seen a lot and heard a lot about some of the challenges. I've had the great opportunity of hearing you speak before in Montreal as well. Um, and some of the, the, the things that you've had to endure. I'd love for you to talk about, you've talked about the tech companies as being a big part of the challenge here. That really this is, they profit out of, out of uh, not telling the truth. They profit out of the fact that we live in a world of infotainment, uh, infodemic. Um, you know, all of these things are meant to go viral and it's that virility that um, makes them profit. It's not necessarily in providing you a trusted news story. So 
what is the, what is the message to all of us as consumers of news and as consumer of all these tech platforms that you think um, you'd like people to take away from today? Yeah, I'm I'm very happy to be having this conversation here uh, at the Basili Institute and to be talking with Canadians because you have some very important work to do and it's incumbent upon everybody in this room to think about the legacies we are going to leave for the next generation about technology and its relationship to governments. So if you walk away from here remembering everything that John and Anne and Besma have said, only remember this that I have said, <laughs> which is that <laughs> the product is the policy. So when tech companies are shoving AI down your throat in every meta product that you have in your phone, it's to get out ahead of any regulatory discussion that we might have about how these technologies are made are they for the benefit of society? Are they just uh, sort of like a, a, gra a smash and grab? Um, big data was a smash and grab on uh, lots of artists' creative work, right? It, everything became data and we stopped worrying about, well, are these websites adhering to any kind of copyright? Uh, are these websites remunerating creators in the way that they're, l you know, sma they're pushing ads on top of everything. Uh, so just like, you know, when a company like Lime shows up in a town and throws, you know, 1,400 scooters in the middle of downtown and says, you know, figure it out. Some people are going to try it out. Some people are going to throw those scooters in the Charles River, as they did in Boston. Uh, but these products, when they get rolled out, we need to have uh, a nimble, reactive response from government to say, well, wait a second. Well, what is behind this technology? How is this technology made? And what kind of data is in this technology? Is it, uh, is it things that people have been informed of that they're giving data about? And right now, if you read uh, books about what's happening with your data online, which I highly recommend everybody reads, Your Face Belong to Us, just leave it up to the professor to give homework. Um, <laughs> but this book by Kashmir Hill, who's a New York Times journalist, really goes through and shows you how a technology like Clearview AI, which can take anybody's face, any picture of you, and then link it to every picture of you online and the associated data. Uh, so that means if you're walking behind someone or you're sitting behind someone at a at a hockey game and someone t you gets your picture, Clearview AI has developed technology that can tell exactly who you are and where else you've been on the internet. Where the problem lies isn't just that your face is your essence, it is your being, but also that it's stored as math and is traded amongst other companies. Your data has been converted and this da these data sets and this technology is for sale. And the biggest company or the biggest contractors of Clearview AI technology right now are US sheriff and law enforcement departments. So this is another way they make the policy uh, happen or the policy work that needs to happen, the way they stop it from happening is by partnering with the state so that the state is the uh, most prominent user which makes us not want to reflect on and question the technology at hand. And when I tell you that your face and your voice are your identity, uh, we are familiar with concepts like identity fraud related to our financials. But imagine a world in which all of your friends and neighbors are getting advertisements with your face and your voice attached to them, right? These are the technologies that are on the precipice right now. And we need biometric information privacy uh, acts uh, in every country to stop these companies from generating uh, more and more data around our faces and our voices. 
And I say that Canada is really important for preventing this is because if you can make it expensive for them to put the product out preemptively, then they are going to find another value chain. They are going to pursue a different kind of technology because ultimately these are businesses. They're not invested in the truth. They're not invested in news. There's no response. There's no such thing as responsible AI. There's no ethics involved in the decisions that these companies are making about deploying these technologies and seeing everyone everyone as a potential user. So Anne, y you and I are both in the, in, in the business of international affairs and international security, and we really worry about how this is all being weaponized. So I'd love for you to reflect on what you see, what's the scary world out there for weaponization of data and weaponization of these emerging technologies in the hands of states? I think the first point, Besna, is that we are living in a profoundly different world now, profoundly different world. And uh, where we are seeing a lot of weaponizations is towards individuals and institutions, but towards indi in ins individuals, the tendency seems to be, or the pattern seems to be, to try and wear people down, mm. um, to silence them, to marginalize them, to persecute them, um, to uh, drive them towards mental health challenges. The next step is to try to, if they remain strong, is to try to attack their institutions and try to wear their institutions down. And if the institution stays strong, that's where the weaponization starts because there seems to be efforts to weaponize institutional policies to use against the people and the institutions. So that brings us to policy, and it raises the question of are policies fit for purpose in an intangibles world? And this is an intangibles world which we are now living in. It's 92% um, uh, of the S&P 500 is accounted for by intangibles. So that's a clear indicator. There are many other indicators out there as well. but we need legislators and policymakers who fully understand this intangibles world. At the moment, we are seeing innovations and ideas uh, come into contact with these core enablers like large language models, like algorithms, like AI. That then produces emerging transformative technologies, as it's become uh, known as. But they don't pass through any governance or accountability frameworks. Sometimes at best, it's corporate social responsibility frameworks of the company that actually produces the technology. So if you then go to the civil service and the international civil service, um, there's a lot of questions being asked. You know, we don't understand this. We, we need graduates in these areas. So then you go to the higher education system, but arguably the textbooks are still based on old models and what we know as an international rules-based order. But especially for co countries like Canada, middle economies, there's no rule book there because we're living in a world of winner-takes-all politics and geopolitical rivalries. And the rules-based order of the multilateral system that Canada signed up to is gone. So we, we, you, you talked about you know, the civil liberties challenges, we're talking about you know, trust of in decline. I mean, there's certainly we all know, um, just globally, if we look at um, opinion polls of people in trust in institutions, in government, in experts, in scientists, I mean, the numbers are down significantly compared to four or five years ago and, and more. Um, John, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with this pervasive challenge of Again, this very series is about trust, right? The word is trust. How do you deal with this challenge that people no longer trust anything, right? I mean, everything can be fake. Anything can be fake. We might be a mirage here. We're not really here. I mean, so you're in this really important business of, you know, if you don't have faith in your vote, in the fact that your vote actually is going to count, the whole democratic edifice just crumbles. Uh, how, do you, how do you handle this broader 
systemic social challenge of people don't believe anymore in what we thought were, again, the norms and real things of the world. Uh, from my standpoint, I see it through election officials um, that really are the ones accountable for uh, running the democratic process. And um, so with an eye towards the US system specifically, uh, it's a real challenge. And so what we're seeing is election officials will run a meeting uh, in a small little county um, and prior to 2020, I mean, no one from the public would go to an election board meeting. Uh, it's the most boring thing in the world. Uh, and every citizen gets a three minute speech and, and goes on a diatribe from the quote, own research that they've done. Um, and then of course the, the clerk will then, in a, in a very polite way, remind people that we have paper ballots uh, that are watched in a bipartisan um, form. Um, they're never taken out of uh, the secure um, custody of the county and bipartisan officials, and they're hand counted uh, in audits and recounts. And then the next person comes up and then repeats the exact same thing. Um, and in one of our counties, the meeting started at 9 a.m. and it finished at 1 a.m. Mm. Um, and it was just a, a series of voters coming and saying the same thing over and over. Um, what I will say, what I've learned is that it's expensive to produce good news. Hmm. Um, so I, it, not by choice, I've learned a lot about the news system and it's expensive to have an editorial room um, and uh, to follow a journalistic process. And I was as guilty as anyone hmm. of not paying for my news. Um, and my new philosophy is you gotta pay for your news um, and you should probably have a couple sources of uh, proper news agencies that, that do invest in an editorial board. Um, and it's just all around me everywhere I look. The other day, my, I'm, I'm looking at my father's phone, just happened to look over his shoulder, and he, he's somehow subscribed to one of the biggest um, dis disinformation sites that have attacked me over the last four years, and he's quoting something, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, how did you get onto this? And he's like, well, I, I don't know, I just got the email. He has no idea how he signed up for it, and it was just, a t it's a terrible, terrible site. Um, you know, I have, I have an aunt who spews something about back in the day for that she learned on WhatsApp, and it's, you know, a fuzzy, out of focus um, JPEG that, you know, that has some BS researcher from some university that I looked up and doesn't exist, and was some claim. Um, and, you know, she probably forwarded it to 40 people. So I think it's just all around us, and creating that resilience um, is really tough, yeah. really tough. Well, and you're speaking to the clickbait of it all, right? I mean, this is the this is the real challenge, is that we all know that if something has a depressing, you know, headline, we're more likely to, to click on it. Um, I've certainly been told, writing op-eds, you know, if you just stick the name Trump in there, it'll get clicked on more. So, I mean, the editors will tell you, can we squeeze in Trump there somewhere? I mean, these are clickbaits that we know. There's a profit mechanism behind it, and it's not necessarily to get us to the truth. It's to entertain us uh, yet again. Joan, you've studied these platforms uh, immensely. Um, content moderators, I'd love for you to talk about this because this is what really opened my eyes to the challenge that we face today, which is, you know, content moderators, which are kind of like what's supposed to be the, the editors or, you know, fact checkers. You know, there are some places where there's just no profit mechanism behind them. And then we have things like the terrible Rohingya, you know, genocide because there was no profit mechanism for a content mo moderator to, to know the, the local languages and, and so things get, so how do you, like, what do you think is the responsibility of these tech companies in these situations and can we ever get there? Yeah, I think, it, you know, when, uh, no one's gonna blame, you know, the guy or gal running a newsstand for, you know, the news you know, nobody's blaming the, n the newsstand guy for the news being bad that day, mm. right? But when you start to mix together the delivery of news with algorithms that are meant to promote things that are novel and outrageous, those are the two qualities of most viral mm. uh, posts, is that no one else is saying that shit and it's so crazy, you gotta see it for yourself, right? We're all guilty. 
right? They used to be, you know, U.S. News at the cashier station, you know, you're going through the groceries and you're like, wow, that kid is half bat, half boy, <laughs> right? And you're just like, that seems, what about his mother, right? <laughs> so, you know, there, there were signals, there were ways that we could know before, but what Facebook got obsessed with in Twitter as well was this notion of the content card where you wouldn't need to know where you were getting your news from because you just saw it on Facebook or you saw it on Twitter. And so they started to deprecate, you know, the, the actual URLs. So it became, there were just these tiny little gray letters in the side that would say The Guardian or CBC. So it, by design, these platforms wanted to take credit for all journalism, good, bad, or indifferent. And that's how they were getting people to come back to their platforms every day, was by having that information and making it seeable on a browser in that platform. And over time, we became very accustomed to having the news find you, right? So rather than you going out and saying, oh, I'm going to read the news today, or I'm getting a paper, or I'm going to open up just this, you know, a New York Times app, you go on social media and interesting things would be showing up. And it was very strategic when the clickbait uh, group started to talk with, you know, uh, political organizations who were thinking, well, we just want to get our platform or our candidate in the mix on social media. So it begins almost innocently enough. But over time, as political operatives start using these platforms, as politicians start using them, everything goes, you know, ass overhead. And, you know, I think one of the best solutions we could have would be to ban politicians from social media. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to, but we're not allowed to. <laughs> and the reason why we're not allowed to is actually we should know who it is that's running for office, and we should know what their platform is. But we also shouldn't be subject to any kind of harebrained idea or slogan or meme they want to put in, pe in front of people. It's almost as if everybody became a politician in 2016 through 2020 so that they could evade the rules of these platforms and get their political interests in front of you. And the last thing I'll say about this as well, because I think it's really crucial to think about when the news finds you. Well, what are you doing on the flip side of that to say, well, is this a reputable source? Is this, you know, a, a newspaper of repute that I am looking at? And I think a lot of us, because we've grown up to trust news organizations to do that vetting for us, we really fell off when it became all tabloid all the time on these platforms, especially as politicians realized that people don't want politics every day, but they do want the news. So they piggyback their politics into your news so that you are constantly getting reinforced some kind of political messaging. But we could also just kick politicians off the internet. <laughs> They'll just create their own platform, as some have, well, right? We'll we see how good that's going in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and what's our role as educators? I mean, there's three of us here who are in the business of hopefully shaping young minds. And mm -hmm. what's the role of, of educators of higher ed? Yeah, I mentioned building resilience through better critical thinking and problem-solving skills. And, um, you know, critical thinking and methodology, they're not very sexy words, are they? But disinformation is a word that I find in my research is uh, people try to avoid it sometimes. It's associated with the intelligence sector and it's a bit of a cursed area. And yet it's one of the leading national security threat vectors for this country and many of our like-minded allies. And if you look at big threat vectors, there's whole curriculum and modules built around them in higher education. So I think we should sort of remove the mystique from disinformation, socialize it um, as something that everybody needs to know about and problem solve around and 
build that critical thinking capacity. Um, yeah, I think you know we're seeing a lot of trends out there at the moment where there's you know bigger distinction in some cases between activism and scholarship and what does scholarship mean in 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 today's profoundly changed world? Reviewing those principles of scholarship, strengthening um, uh, panels like this that bring lots of different perspectives together to show that that's how every challenge should be approached by way of voices represented from every corner of society. And uh, there's there's re increasing reports that uh, AI is getting better and better through these large language models and the signposting that used to be quite evident around disinformation is just not there as much anymore. You know, we used to see rants or dramatically broken expressions that were trying to convince us of things, and we're not seeing that anymore. So the, we, we've got to be very, very savvy to understand where this is all coming from. Yeah, in fact, if you've noticed this in the past, since ChatGPT, our spam email have come to be more sophisticated. And that's partly because they're now written by ChatGPT, so they have less grammatical errors, they're more convincing, and add in that cognitive layer of knowing your profile are tailored to you. You like cats, you're gonna have disinformation about cats. You like, mm -hmm. you know, dogs. And so personalization is now the next level of disinformation, so it's getting more sophisticated by the day. And can I just say that Chat uh, 4 came out yesterday, and the translation capability is huge now. So uh, increasingly, we're seeing reports of you know, illicit groups trying to write down different narratives, rewrite history for their populations, and all of this is getting translated into you know, all the spoken languages around the world in a profoundly effective way. Absolutely. John, what's the, what's the role for the corporate sector? I mean, you know, there's a lot of pressure on corporations today uh, to be responsible actors, um, but in the disinformation space in particular, what can, what can corporate leadership look like in this space? Oh, geez, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm qualified uh, on that one. Um, from my perspective, we definitely experience what happens when trusted news organizations intentionally lie. Um, in, in our case, we were the victim and, 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 and it caused an enormous amount of damage and we were able to hold them to account. On the flip side, um, I look at, I, I'm often asked, should the bar for holding news media uh, to account be lessened? And, and my personal opinion is no. Um, I, it's extremely difficult to sue a news media organization in the United States for defamation. And I think that's, it should be like that. Um, and I think that we have always trusted news, trusted news organizations to hold our politicians to account, to hold companies to account, uh, to hold you know anything that's going on in our society to account. And uh, if they get, if they make a well-intentioned mistake in pursuit of the story, I mean that's one thing. Um, and a responsible news organization usually pivots and corrects when it's pointed out to them. Can I add a little bit to this because? One of the things fundamentally that we don't talk a lot about that we need to um, is advertising infrastructure. Mm. So everything online is not built to uh, improve the public experience of the web. It's built to deliver ads. Social media is an advertising system you are allowed to use for free because you are sort of the soil they till when they sell advertising. And so there's no difference between, uh, you know, Coca-Cola posting something on Instagram or X or Facebook uh, uh, different from you, except that they may pay the company, uh, the tech platform, uh, a lot of money to share or to force feed those ads to different audiences. And so the profiling actually begins, uh, as our data profiling of people begins where Facebook collects something like 37,000 different points of data on each person so that custom niche advertising can be sold. And that might even be as deep as saying, I want you to advertise to every single person that posted congratulations 
uh, is it a boy or a girl, uh, in this area, um, you know, I want you to be advertising to them any particular kind of, uh, let's say, vitamin E lotion or something. That's how fine-grained and specific it can be um, with this advertising. And so the advertising backbone of the Internet, which used to be distributed amongst higher quality news outlets because advertisers were very careful previously about where they spent their money. And that money would often go to support um, reputable news sources because they didn't want it, they didn't want their ads to be sold next to tabloid or potentially scandalous uh, forms of journalism, including gossip columns. And so what ends up happening fundamentally with the structure of social media is it actually looks and becomes and behaves more and more like advertising than any other technology. And yet, we don't regulate it as advertising. We don't think about it as advertising. And part of this is because tech is magic. Tech it makes us feel good. Tech is fun to play with. I don't know you know, anybody that can resist the urge to hit a key on a piano that they walk by, right? There's something about technology that makes us want to touch it, makes us want to interact with it, um, and it's cool. And that's one of the things, uh, am amongst a lot of other things, that are getting in the way of us seeing these systems for what they really are. I want to tell you in 2016, you could not have an argument with someone about the need for Facebook without them bringing up that if we didn't have Facebook, we might not have democracy. And I'll tell you, you do not have more free speech because a tech product or a platform exists. There's no such thing as more free speech. Yet, these companies have been able to build themselves as speech machines and make us believe that without those products, uh, we, we would somehow be rendered inert and unable to govern ourselves. But I assure you, Martin Luther King did not have a computer. <laughs> so one of the big topics um, before us today, I'll, I'll turn to Anne, because I think this has taken over um, a lot of debates in the national security space and certainly international affairs is TikTok. Uh, TikTok is prevalent, as we all know. It's it's uh, where all our tweens pick up lovely dance moves and the rest of it. Um, but it's also been uh, raised as a real platform for disinformation, and increasingly uh, a place that could be weaponized by external actors. In this case, the Chinese government. How do we how do we approach this sensitively in the sense of still keeping to I think the core of our our, our want of civil liberties and freedom of choice in the sense of these platforms, but then recognizing that national security and that there are malicious states that do want to uh, weaponize these tech platforms. Not suggesting that TikTok is one of them, but certainly that's the argument that's being presented today, um, particularly in, in the US Congress. Yeah, and I think um, s uh, some of the algorithms of some of these platforms can have the ability or do have the ability to massively attack a country, a country like Canada. Um, it's the profoundly different world we're living in, I think, is also one that is characterized by enmeshment uh, as opposed to decoupling. So the first Cold War was about decoupling, you know, complete separation. But we have to work with a lot of the actors that we are trying to decouple with in some areas, and we're remaining enmeshed with in a number of other areas. So what does that mean in practice? It means that we have to know a lot about the risks that we are trying to de-risk around. And that goes back to education and looking at this very, very multidisciplinary area to understand what these new national security threat vectors are all about. And I'll go back to education in terms of the knowledge and skill sets that we need to give our graduates to make them fit for purpose out there, not just critical thinkers, but having the bows in their quiver to be able to write policy on these areas, to know the data sets that are relevant to these areas. Um, 
and to uh, know the skill sets, the tools and techniques to develop policy on. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing up, um, you know, the, the Cold War, really, this is where we, we saw, you know, a global arms race, but that was actually good for science and technology, because in fact, you know, just thinking about, you know, the, 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 the space, pro you know, all things space, right? I mean, that kind of competition between the Soviet Union and the United States was a really healthy one to actually advance science and technology in many ways. But what is happening on this tech wars between China and the United States today is actually going to push us back, right? Because we're, we're really asking in this new era of decoupling or de-risking, I mean, they're all the same thing, if you will. It's really about trying to, to unravel um, what has been intimately tied together. And I don't even know if they can do that successfully, but this is going to, I think, really slow down uh, scientific progress and certainly on anything climate change related, solar, EV. I mean, you can just pick your technology. There's gonna be so many consequences to it that I think are uh, a really shame um, for, for human progress. Um, John, let me ask you, I mean, again, back to, you know, your, your company really succeeds when people have trust in the process. I know you're, you know, you're, 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 you're careful in not trying to give, but as a political scientist, I can't help but, you know, ask you these kinds of questions here. But, you know, what do we need to do? What do you think would better um, civil society and sort of that core of um, citizenship engagement needed to have, you know, to have that kind of knowledge and, and confidence in the process. Wh what's missing and why are we just doing so poorly on all these metrics of trust? Well, in terms of the actual uh, mechanics of democracy and elections, uh, I, I don't think you can ever beat volunteering in a polling place. Mm -hmm. um, learn about it firsthand. I mean, our entire democratic system and uh, in the Western world it depends on a large number of people being physically present at a polling location uh, to maintain the uh, chain of custody uh, of secured paper ballots. Um, I think that we need to be very cognizant when we have threats against that. Um, and one of them has uh, um, being the move away from paper ballots, frankly. Um, and uh, moving past the mechanics of elections um, and more into the influence uh, prior to the election day, uh, I think that everyone needs to be very mindful and cognizant of all of the influences that we have um, that in oftentimes are coming from outside of our country. Um, and uh, we learned firsthand that a l w w me and my employees were on a, um, uh, a site for, uh, they were calling for our, our assassination with, I think there was dollar amounts on it, uh, and we, we found out it came from Iran. Um, just like, uh, like uh, some guys from Toronto and some guys from Denver, like how did we get on that? Um, and uh, so just being cognizant of we're influenced all the time. You know, if I go back to the role of trusted media holding companies, holding politicians, holding uh, uh, these events to account, I mean, hypothetical question, would we even know about the Chinese interference if it wasn't for the repeated badgering of the Globe and Mail with a lot of our uh, pundits in Canada um, saying something's there, something's there, we really need to investigate it. Or, uh, you know, the, whatever lab that was in Winnipeg we st that we still don't really know what the Canadian government was doing there. So I, I think it comes back to holding um, people to account, holding uh, these tech companies to account, holding companies to account, holding politicians to account um, uh, against the truth. Well, I mean, again, it, that's a great example that you have. Um, but, you know, like prior to sort of things going viral, we had robocalls, right? I mean, good old fashioned calling uh, citizens, telling them to go to the wrong voting place, which we know existed. Um, and we've heard recently, and you talked about the foreign interference, um, uh, just inquiry happening today and all the background, um, that it's not necessarily a, a lack of, um, you know, tampering with any votes or anything like that, but it's actually at the very local level where we saw, you know, disqualifying or pushing out um, certain candidates for, uh, you know, that favored a different position in the case of what we're seeing today in Canada. So, I mean, this is not new, that there's always going to be some form of for lack of a better word, interference and meddling, and we can call it propaganda, right? I mean, propaganda has been around forever. B but Joan, I mean, you study this, what's so pernicious about it today? Like what's different about today that 
again, why isn't this, we had leaflets coming down from the sky, you know, a yeah. hundred years ago that had propaganda. I mean, what's a, what is it about today that worries you more so than any other time? What worries me now is it's full spectrum. It is full scale information warfare where we don't know who are the citizens and who are the combatants, mm -hmm. right? So you go on social media, you think you're talking to this cute chick, you're like, oh, this is really interesting. And then all of a sudden, it's like two kids in a backpack in their mother's basement, right? So you, you hear about it sensationalized around love scams. Mm. But you can pretend to be a whole country now. You can pretend to be a whole constituency. So some of the stuff that I've looked at over the years are the ways in which groups of people get together using technology to uh, create a, co a lot of fake uproar, like uh, during this moment in the I I in the gaming industry, it was called Gamergate. It was this very overblown, um, uh, a guy had lost uh, his girlfriend. He claimed she was cheating on him. Everybody, it seemed like every single person in the gaming industry had a, 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 a thing to say about it. Then it turned into, well, it's just about ethics and gaming journalism. And all along the way, the voices are getting louder and louder and louder. And then this group pops up claiming to be black women who don't want anyone to get in the way of games. They, they're using this hashtag, not your shield. And they're saying, you know, we're women of color and we don't, you know, want, um, you know, uh, a gaming industry to be upset and, and, and uh, uh, b you know, people be treated like this. And it turns out it was a bunch of white men from a website, uh, an anonymous website, which you may or may not be familiar with called 4chan that it coordinated to impersonate black women online. They even tried to launch a campaign called End Father's Day, saying that like it was you know, uh, unconscionable that we would celebrate Father's Day given that uh, uh, you know, black men were not showing up for their families. And they were pretending to be black women. The only news that picked this up though, of course, was Fox News, mm. right? And the black women online started using uh, very sophisticated investigative journalism techniques to figure out who was pretending to be black women online. This was around 2014. So when things start popping off in 2016 and you realize, well, are these Russians? Are these, you know, two kids in their mom's basement? Is this being coordinated in another country? Or is this political operatives? And you can't tell. And the problem is the disinformation is meant to trick you and it's meant to make you feel powerless. And it, it works in a lot of ways, but it's, it's even harder when it moves from being something small within niche groups online and then it starts to scale and scale and scale. And by 2020, you no longer need those anonymous accounts because politicians are saying the quiet part out loud. Right, and, and Trump is it was the biggest uh, uh, person advancing this idea that the election had been stolen uh, and that it was gonna take you know, thousands of patriots to bring it back. I, you know, the other thing is, I, if we lost the Capitol on that day and um, there, there really is no way for the US military to lose the war, right, when it comes to that, but you, you, the first rule of a successful coup, I think, is to get the military on board, right? Mm -hmm. And Trump failed at that. But it doesn't necessarily mean he'll fail next time, right? And that's why we have to be really careful about who are these people? What kind of rhetoric is indoctrinating them? And um, unfortunately, it's a lot of law enforcement and former vets who are getting dragged into this because they're starting to feel as if their country is slipping away and that they made an oath and, and they wanna uphold that honor. And so unfortunately, when we start to think about this in terms of who the bad actors are, your perspective starts to shift in some ways because you're like, well, maybe they're good people caught up in the wrong you know, reality.
and, and this is why it gets back to holding institutions to account, holding the news media to account, holding politicians to account, and holding these tech companies to account because these technologies are not neutral. They are coordinating technologies that are on a scale that we would hesitate to allow even any company to have this much power uh, in terms of connectivity. Well, and if I just may add, John, I mean, I think um, from my understanding too, it's not so much that the push of this disinformation, particularly from rogue states, to is to convince you in the, the message that's being forced upon you, is to doubt the next message, right? The whole idea is to just for you to lose trust in the entire edifice of what is you know, today the information landscape. So you start to, you, you just lose trust in everything being real and somehow accurate. Yeah, but it, it's hard to say, right? Because we all would live in this world notionally imagining that, well, we have a system of government, we have journalists, we have businesses. These great powers should be keeping each other in check so that the rest of us can go on, you know, our, you know, uh, we're only interrupted every couple of months to vote or to have our say in city hall, but we don't live in a robust participatory democracy either. And so when news becomes terrifically expensive and is underfunded, and then you have the extraction of advertising, which inadvertently used to supply us with good information, we then have to think about, well, what's the government institution that is going to replace this? Do we add more value to organizations that do what I call talk, timely, accurate local knowledge? So it doesn't necessarily have to be news, but you can also invest in civil society and in other ways of promoting trust and truth in a more local way. The greatest failure of the internet, but my biggest hope for AI, is that we can actually localize the internet. Everything that goes online is an international thing at that point. But how do we use the best of this technology to get back to what matters so that when you search for something, you're getting local results that are tied to uh, uh, verified websites? Because uh, I think there's a way to organize information online, and this is where you know I call out the librarians in the audience and say, this is on you. Like we need strong librarians to come in and say, how do we organize the world's knowledge? Because Google's not going to do it, mm. right? And so we have to build that muscle uh, and think about well, what is the the future of this technology if what we know is we need more locally grounded knowledge. Yeah, and remember, the, the content of the internet doubles every two years. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's incredible, right? So yeah, we should just delete some of it. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling people, if I had a website, it would just be pictures of my cat, and every time you click something, you are just paying me a dollar. <laughs> that would be the best website. Okay, so we've got two mics on either side here. Please feel free to, to come down and ask a question. And there's a few that have come through registration that I'll start to ask if I may. So um, how and to what level does disinformation and misinformation contribute to oppression? That's a big question. Well, uh, I'll take a stab. Um, I, I think it gr can, has the potential to greatly contri contribute to oppression, especially in societies where, where dissent is, is quashed and uh, where governments control the yeah. internet and bring it up and bring it down when they think it suits best. Um, yeah, it's, it's... And it targets women uh, far more than men, and it targets disproportionately know, racialized people, yeah. LGBTQ plus. And uh, if you, you think about AI mm -hmm. as well, the way it spins these things, it it doesn't it, it it rules out voices again because it spins the things that are most cited. So absolutely, yeah. Okay, we've got our first question. Thank you very much uh, for giving a shout out to Quality News and supporting Quality News. Uh, my question is, um, people they'll pay for Netflix and Spotify and all of these, subscribe to all of these 
uh, services, but they won't pay for news. In Canada, you're looking at 11% who will pay for online news. How can we build a culture of appreciation for quality journalism? I mean, uh, one or two tyrants will do it. <laughs> Am I right? If we're talking about the long durée here, if you uh, don't realize the value of local information that is trustable, that's objective, you'll have you uh, you will undoubtedly have a corrupt, you know, attorneys. You'll have corrupt local politicians because eventually, if nobody's minding the bank, you know, the bankers become the bank robbers. And so there's a lot to lose when you don't have investigative journalism and you don't have the fourth estate uh, listening and looking and causing justice. I think about this uh, right now in Massachusetts, there's this crazy case going on with this woman, Karen Reed, who was framed for murdering her boyfriend. And the cover-up was so extensive that even the FBI that had to come investigate the murder of this man, uh, was I the FBI agent was in on the cover-up and he was friends with uh, the people who had committed the crime. But nevertheless, this woman is going through this trial when it's very clear that there was a cover-up and the people that are on the stand are um, lying. The, the forensic information, and, and it's playing out like you would imagine any episode of Dateline NBC or 2020, right? Uh, but if it weren't for the internet and people in that town raising the alarm bells and saying there is something fishy here, these are lawless cops that murdered this man and not, uh, her, not this guy's girlfriend, we wouldn't have justice. Right, and so I think it's really important that we look at those structures of ac accountability and strengthen them before you get people that have a little bit of power and a whole lot of nerve uh, showing up in and and running our cities and towns. And I think that that's you know uh, the most crucial function of uh, news is to uncover and illuminate. Sure, but I, I'm wondering if you have any specific suggestions of how we can create that culture of appreciation. Because those investigative journalism is happening uh, every year. There are awards, national awards for public service journalism, but people aren't actively participating, supporting local news. Are, do you have anything specific suggestions? Uh, you can, okay, so one of the things would be to strengthen your journalism schools so that they're teaching people in freshman year how to be a better steward of participatory media. Uh, this, uh, this is something that I'm working on at BU with Brian McGorry, who is the editor-in-chief of the Boston Globe. I walk around campus all the time and I say, everybody's a journal-ish, because we've all got the tools of broadcast in our pockets, but we don't have the training to understand what it is that we should look for, how to edit things, how to appropriately source things. And so I think, journalism has become so ubiquitous that we don't even recognize it as such. And we need to now teach those skills, you know, maybe in high school and, and certainly as a general education credit in universities so that everyone understands becoming a uh, high quality purveyor of news and information through their own uh, online activities. Again, please, anybody who wants to come down. Oh, we've, I'm so sorry. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is related to the potential TikTok ban in the US. So given how problematic all of the social media platforms are, um, in particular Meta, um, I'd love to hear your opinion on why this, I, I understand we've heard the reasons uh, from the government, but I'd love to hear from you why you think that there could be this potential TikTok ban and why TikTok? So I'll, I'll come out and say it. I think, it's, I think this is all Meta and Alphabet or Google just trying to get a market share. They saw an opportunity after October 7th to make the claim that TikTok was behaving like Russia 
in terms of forcing content into the world that was propagandistic. And their evidence was there was more pro-Palestinian content on TikTok than on other platforms. Researchers are so locked out of platforms that there is no researcher in the world that can create that statistic. It was all propaganda. And, but what it did on the Hill uh, was cause a stir, this idea that China could, if they wanted to, sow the flames uh, of, of dissent and discord in the US uh, populace. This happens at the same time that young people finally back in school are returning to a critical consciousness that things are not as they are told and things aren't what they seem and they are reacting to a world in which they feel that and I don't know if it's I, I don't think they necessarily object to Israel existing they're they're objecting to what Israel is doing in Gaza and that is being confused with this idea that China is pushing this propaganda through TikTok. When I look at pro-Palestinian content on TikTok, 95% of it is students at these protests. Before even the encampments, they were at these rallies, they were at vigils, there was candles. Um, the students and young people are afraid for the future in a world where we will passively accept, you know, the murder of thousands of civilians. Um, and I, I would be afraid if we didn't have a student movement by now stepping up and saying something. Uh, I would be very scared of students that were so politically nihilistic and almost empty that they could not feel compassion uh, for what's happening uh, and, and, and have or want to have a say. Uh, so I'm not surprised to see the students escalating right now, but I do think um, in all of my years of researching, uh, TikTok has not been at all on any scale as bad as YouTube, uh, X in particular, uh, and Facebook. I mean, and one way around this is for them to actually be more forthcoming about how their algorithms work, right? I mean, this is part of the challenge is, you know, is that there, there's no transparency. Uh, when we had API of Twitter and we're able to, as researchers, be able to get some of that, you know, peek behind uh, the curtain, if you will, it, it just it allowed us to just have that ability to, to do these kinds of really good research. I know I've, I've read some of yours and others that, that can look at those, um, uh, look at the look at the tweets and actually have a very I think knowledgeable assessment of what's happening here. But when there's no clarity about how these algorithms work, um, then we start to wonder and see, for example, ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok. You know, if you go in China and use this similar platform as as TikTok, it's all feeding young children how to be better citizens, how to. I mean, none of the junk. Sorry, and I'm not referring to the pro Palestinian no, but content, I will, I will the dance you. videos and the rest. Yeah. That's not on the ByteDance you know, China platform, but is that all the US, demand or? There's, yeah. there's a button you can press. There's the For You page, which is the one the kids love. Yeah. And then there's one called STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do micro learning on the platform. Not, uh, you know, I, 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 I have no stock options. <laughs> but I will tell you that like, you know, the kinds of entertainment that these kids are seeking, you know, is very similar to my generation's MTV. You know, the music videos are going to rot your brain. They're only four minutes long. And sit back away from the TV. Exactly. <laughs> sit back it's from gonna the ruin TV. Your eye. You're, it's going to hurt your eyes if you get that <laughs> close. And we're all just trying to, like, reach yeah. into the screen and dance with Cyndi Lauper, right? Oh, so, the best. You know, but that's, that's the point here, right, is what do we really care about? You know, we care that our kids have friends. We care that our kids care about other people and we care that they come home at a respectable hour, right? Um, what's important here is that your kid's socialization is happening outside of the internet as well, and that they see the internet as a fun extension of their relationships and not the core 
of their relationships. Yeah, definitely. Please. Hi. Thank you for sharing the information tonight. Um, there, I, I find there's a lot of distrust as far as the media goes. That if you mentioned, thank you for sharing that. But where do you go and get your information? I mean, I have I sign up for newspapers, etc., and I have a lot of different sites I go to. But where do you go? That something that you trust. And also, is there a big agenda behind this? I could mention organizations that can be involved, but is there an agenda behind this uh, this whole movement that's taking place in all aspects? And I like the word weaponized, like there's a lot of things that have been weaponized, migrations and other things as well, but we won't go there. But I'm just saying, is there a bigger agenda and what sources should I go to to get reliable um, sources for information? Thank you. John, why don't we start with you? Let's go down the path. Um, get your news. Ironically, I, I started subscribing to the Wall Street Journal, um, okay. which is a Rupert Murdoch property. Um, I they, 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 do, they do, frankly, I think a good job. Um, um, I subscribe to the Globe and Mail, um, The Economist, New York Times, Washington Post. Um, and uh, uh, I don't hesitate, especially there's, I, from our experience, there's a number of local uh, newspapers mm -hmm. um, that have very strong uh, reporters that really have demonstrated getting to the bottom of the story, and I will not hesitate um, when I'm when I see that pay button, you know, pay the dollar ninety nine, um, and I just equate it, you know, once I got over the hump of, I used to, you know, you buy songs on. on hasn't been for a while, but it, like a dollar ninety nine on iTunes, and, you, and people do that, no problem. And then there seems like such an aversion to buy a story that's well produced by a good reporter. Um, so I learned the hard way. Well said. Well said. I know we have two other questions. Can we just take them and we'll please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there one there? I sincerely apologize. Okay. Um, hi, thanks so much everybody. Um, my question kind of picks up on something that Joan was saying, but I think um, a lot of people have talked about it in, in a little bit, which is the idea of you know good people living in a different reality. Um, so I'm kind of curious how we can address an increase in conspiratorial thought and stuff like that among people who on some level have a reason to feel that way. You know, it's been something hard to swallow as a scientist is that you know one thing that drives people towards um, sources, bad sources of alternative medicine, stuff like that, sort of exploitative sources, um, is that they have been genuinely mistreated by the medical system. And so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. T can I, can we take all next, to, there's two more people standing, I just wanna take your questions. I'm told that, that this, that would be the last one, but I'd just love to hear your two questions and then we'll open it all up. Is that okay? Please. Yes, um, so my question is actually referring to the student encampments that are happening ac around the world, including here within our community at the University of Waterloo um, this very evening, um, is that we talk a lot about this idea of, th there's this rhetoric in science communication of it's not a good idea to do your own research, um, which I know is, th it, it is a nuanced topic, um, but as citizens living in a democracy, how do we actually do our own research and ensure that um, politicians and leaders can listen to us? And how do we actually hold them, our institutions, our politicians and our leaders accountable as you've referenced to multiple times today? Thank you, and then last question. Good evening, everyone. Um, my question is more with accountability, um, with how do you increase democracy in the world today that's being decreased because we are becoming disenfranchised more and more. Um, for example, an election, we do it once every five years. Um, so if we have a country like Switzerland that has a policy referendum on a topic and people get their ideas together and propose it and then they pass it, I mean, that's more on a... Um, not a daily basis, but more on a monthly basis, you can get like an idea and get voted. That's direct democracy. How do we get that back? Mm -hmm. yeah. In a country like ours that we just vote, okay, once, show up, go home, and then lament after that all the ideas we have cannot be expressed. So three great questions. Yeah, and I, I, I just wanna say, you know, there's more to life than, there's more to politics and political life than voting. And one of the things that we've seen decline over the years is 
uh, participation in, in civil society groups. So everybody here has an issue. I'm not, you know, going to get into your psyche. But there is, everyone has an issue that just, you know, it's an itch they can't stop scratching. So try to find a civil society group where people are digging into and trying to understand that issue, whether it's anti-war, whether it's women's reproductive rights, whether it's uh, trans visibility, whether it's getting people access to medicine and food, but find your issue, find the people in your community working on that issue, and you will find yourself cultivating and understanding and sourcing new information through those groups and through that interaction. One of the most important things um, I have come to realize as a scholar is that truth is a human process. You know, Elon Musk once said, I'm gonna build truth GPT. And I was like, okay, after the flying cars, man. Like, good job, you know. He's built a blowtorch. That's one thing he built, right? He's got a flamethrower in his name. But I say to you, truth is a human process because truth arrives through deliberation. Truth arrives through data and analysis. Truth is not discovered in that, you know, Columbus sense of the word. It is negotiated, and it's negotiated based on facts. And what, unfortunately, we have come to do is give people a break when they say, oh, this statistic, and you're like, well, they sound really smart, right? But what you start to dig into when you do your own research is that some of that science is bunk, some of that science is fake, and it's also meant to emotionally motivate you and manipulate you into whatever it is that that um, entity is seeking, whether it's a state operation, whether it's a political operation, whether it's marketers. So treat the internet um, as something entirely in development that will have some good information from some valid sources, but you still have to think your own thoughts, mm -hmm. and you still have to arrive at what you truly believe, and you should arrive at that information with the knowledge that you have done your homework, not just passively accepted what other people are telling you, and, and I guarantee you'll find a lot of validation in working on issues that you care about, right? One of the best things that can come out of a public policy school is people who know the value of participation in pu making public policy. And so I leave you with that challenge. John, and then final words for Anne. Um, I'll, I'll address the direct democracy question um, just from a practitioner standpoint, practical problem, not from whether or not one is better than another, but um, we've certainly seen a whole bunch of different electoral styles. Uh, a lot of counties in the United States, for example, will vote for dog catcher, local dog catcher. Um, and um, depending on who you ask, that is uh, more democracy. Um, and some would argue that's taking it too far. Um, and uh, if you look at some other jurisdictions that have implemented um, single transferable vote or ranked choice voting, uh, you know, s pretty much the opposite of what we have on the federal level uh, with uh, first past the post voting. Um, and there's all sorts of consequences that come with that too, which is pretty interesting. And I will not, and I'll say my own opinion, I don't think they're all positive. Some are positive, some are also negative. Um, and it, it one, one of the observations I've made from just seeing a few of them uh, is hard to get a government without um, a coalition of a lot of fringe um, uh, people on, on fringe topics, let's mm. just say it that. So it's, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting question. I don't think, I, if anyone has written a, 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 um, the definitive paper on what the right electoral model, I certainly haven't seen it. Um, and um, practically in Canada, it's four years, it's not five years, it's just a high cost if you go to five years. But um, I, I I was, I was very much on the side of let's reform uh, voting, let's mm -hmm. go single transferable vote. There's a really fascinating experience that happened in 2010 in British Columbia 
um, where they randomly picked one, one woman and one man from each of the ridings from across the province and asked them to sit through two years of the most boring lectures of electoral experts from around the world, um, from Europe, Asia, Middle East, uh, the United States, uh, and they came up with this system. And one thing I'll say, it, it was so complex. Uh, with an engineering degree, uh, we could not uh, agree on what the right calculation was to figure out the winner. Mm. Um, because it basically would, every vote would turn into a fraction and the winner would only get the enough fractions of a vote to get exactly 51%. Um, and so it, it, then the remainder gets carried on to your second, third, fourth choices. Um, <laughs> Just there's no there's no right answer on that one, but I will say I, I do believe that we get the democracies we deserve. Mm, yeah. And final thoughts. Yeah, I'm just going to extend on something that Joan said, which was you know get off the internet and make sure that there's a percentage of your time off the internet. And it reminded me of the soft issues that we can't forget about. Um, one of the reasons why I was invited to facilitate international peace talks even by other governments like the British government. As many people would say, you're Canadian. You know, you guys stand for human rights. You're so good at democracy and you don't bring a colonial cloak of any sort. And there were all sorts of positive reasons that justified the case for me to come and facilitate these talks. I was very proud of that. And when I looked back at my experience with the Canadian government, and watching people in diplomatic missions abroad, Canadians work, everybody was always working for a higher common denominator than the lowest common, easiest outcome. But for that sort of thing, we need leadership. But we also need social capital. And that's part of the national security debate that doesn't get talked about too much. But if you go back to Lockean and Hobbesian mm -hmm. theories, it's all about the strength of the social fabric. Yeah. And I think we have to ask ourselves these days, what is Canadianness? What is the Canadian identity? Because it can get lost a little bit when geopolitics from all over the world are playing out on our soil. And so it's only for us to restore that Canadianness. I highly agree with your point that we should get involved in civil society events because what that brings are different perspectives and for people to view others disagreeing with each other and having different perspectives, but conducting themselves with decency and decorum. And I think that's what we really need to return to, encourage people to return to. Don't go to an event if it's an event on a position, <laughs> one position. Don't go in a to an event if all the candidates speaking on a panel are coming from the same area. So exercise judiciousness in the spirit of the social contract. Thank you, well said. Ashley. Well, I sure didn't think this outcome was fine. So I want to thank our panelists, John and Joan, and our moderator, Besma, for contributing to a thought-provoking discussion. And thanks also to everybody here and online for your time and your questions uh, in, in joining us. I have just a few items to share with you. Uh, reminder there will be, for those of you here, uh, light refreshments offered in the atrium outside the lecture theater. Um, and you can continue this conversation, some of these conversations or, or some of the questions or other conversations that we weren't able to get to. Uh, we also have two events happening in September to share, and the first one, I think, really follows this conversation in the many ways the, the, I, it, it would be impossible to have all of the conversations about this topic tonight, but the Faculty of Science Foundation at the University of Waterloo is hosting a lecture by Professor Timothy Caulfield on September 12th on campus, and the topic will be related to misinformation. Um, and if you're not familiar with him, I believe his most recent book was called Relax, Damn It. So, um, so he talks a lot about wellness, health, sort of all the mixed messaging we get. So that promises to be a highly in engaging and interesting uh, lecture. Uh, also, we'll be hosting the next Trust Lecture on Monday, September 16th on the University of Waterloo campus. 
and the discussion will center around climate change. And um, you can scan this QR code on the screen, or you can just go to our website. And as we have more information about those events, we'll post them and share them so you can be apprised of that. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone and hope to see you at our next event. And uh, thank you, and I hope everybody gets home safe. All right, thanks. <laughs>